The story of Free Jack begins with another story. We can remember it for you wholesale, the novelette by Philip K. Dick. Writers Ron Shusett and Dan O'Bannon were working on a screenplay for the novelette in the mid-70s when they realized it would be way too difficult to make with the technology available at the time. They put the story on the back burner and decided to move ahead with another idea, which turned into the film Alien. Over a decade later, they returned to the Philip K. Dick story, and it evolved into the blockbuster hit Total Recall. Sometime in between, Ron Shusett acquired the rights to the 1958 novella Immortality Delivered by Robert Sheckley. The novella was expanded into a full novel and was rebranded as Immortality Incorporated in 1959, which was then nominated for a Hugo Award for Best Novel. The story was about Thomas Blaine, a boat designer who dies in a car crash in the year 1958. He wakes up in the year 2110 to discover his mind was being transferred to a new body as part of a publicity stunt for a major corporation. Now living more than a century in the future, he has to navigate this strange new world, a world that has changed immensely since he died. In the future, death is no longer a mystery, it's a commodity. Science has not only figured out time travel, but also that the afterlife is real. So the world of 2110 is full of poltergeists, ghosts, and zombies. An afterlife can be bought, and bodies have essentially become something traded like used cars. The rich live in giant, well-guarded high-rises and hunt the poor for sport. Blaine takes a job as a hunter of sorts, and joins in most dangerous game-style human safaris. Life in 2110 was so hard, there were suicide booths on street corners, which was later parodied in the show Futurama. Immortality Incorporated was way ahead of its time, and even though Sheckley wrote many sci-fi novels, he called the genre junk food for the mind. The novel was adapted to the first episode of the third season of Out of the Unknown, a BBC sci-fi anthology show from the 60s. Unfortunately, the tape this was recorded on was wiped, so no footage of it exists. While working on Total Recall, Shusett was developing the script for Immortality Incorporated. Only his script was much different from the source. The basic concept was taken, and the rest was altered. Since Shusett co-wrote Total Recall, he wanted to make sure to write Immortality Incorporated to be more serious. He was afraid that people would think he was a one-trick pony if he added in humor like he did with Total Recall. The stories are already kind of similar. We Can Remember It For You Wholesale was about implanting artificial memories. Immortality Incorporated is about implanting real memories from one person to another. After all the changes from the novel to the script, they removed the protagonist, Blaine. It's now about Alex, a race car driver who died tragically in a crash in 1991. He's then transported into the far, far future of 2009. So instead of being decades into the future like the novel, the time gap was now reduced to 18 years. This made it so, while there would be obvious changes in the world, there would still be people alive who Alex knew. Through rewrites, he got rid of the ghosts, zombies, and much of the novel. In its place, he put tons of action. It read more like a summer blockbuster instead of a thought-provoking film about the value of life. He then sold the script to Morgan Creek, who at the time were working on their biggest production to date, Robin Hood, Prince of Thieves. Morgan Creek had one person in mind for Immortality Incorporated, Bruce Willis, although he was busy with something else, so he passed on it. After he sold the script, Shusett reached out to the writer of the novel, Robert Sheckley. Sheckley hadn't read his script and wasn't consulted about the film, which he was fine with. He said, I already had my fun with it. Also going on at the time, New Zealand director Jeff Murphy was directing Young Guns 2 for Morgan Creek. This was his first American production. Before this, he made numerous films in New Zealand, one of which was the award-winning sci-fi film The Quiet Earth. Murphy was a pioneer who put New Zealand on the cinematic map. Goodbye Pork Pie was the first local New Zealand film to attain blockbuster status. He came to the U.S. because of the limitations of New Zealand. In New Zealand, there's no domestic market that can support films, so they rely solely on government filmmaking grants. However, because of this, he was freer to make the movies he wanted to make. He knew that by coming to America, he wasn't going to have the same amount of cinematic freedom. He resigned himself to the thought that in Hollywood, you're not making art, you're making product, and any art you can sneak in is an art unto itself. The director almost held numerous films in the U.S., one of which was Predator, but that's another story. Back to Young Guns 2. Morgan Creek was investing everything they had into what they were sure would be a huge hit in Robin Hood, Prince of Thieves. Due to this, 
All the executives were busy overseeing that, and Murphy had pretty much full creative control, and the studio left him alone to make his film, for the most part. Murphy wasn't too keen on making a sequel, but did enjoy westerns, so he figured he'd be able to put his own spin on it. Young Guns 2 did very well for Morgan Creek, making slightly more than the original. This made Morgan Creek very happy, and they offered him another film for twice what he was paid for Young Guns 2. They offered him Immortality Incorporated, which was now retitled Free Jack. Murphy loved sci-fi, and after reading the script, he thought it had potential. He recognized the script had problems, though. Being a sci-fi fan, he was aware of Immortality Incorporated. The novel had lots of interesting concepts about life and death. None of that existed in the current script. He said at the time the best sci-fi films were few and far between. There was Alien, Blade Runner, and 2001. Those were the kind of sci-fi movies he wanted to make. He was concerned because the script was from Ron Shusett, who just finished Total Recall. He didn't want to make a straight sci-fi action film. He wanted to make something with character and social commentary. The studio, on the other hand, wanted a sci-fi movie with a superhero, something larger than life. The director said all the unique ideas from the book were purged in order to make a Schwarzenegger-type action script. Arnold Schwarzenegger was huge at the time with blockbuster after blockbuster, and many studios were busy trying to make their movies into Schwarzenegger movies. It didn't always work. Immortality Incorporated was a good example because it wasn't that kind of thing. The original story as it was written was about scientific proof of the afterlife, which had a fundamental effect on the public's perception of the sanctity of life. None of that existed in this version. Murphy noted that the changes from the novel to the script was similar to what happened when they took We Can Remember It For You wholesale and turned it into Total Recall. Essentially, taking a very complex and nuanced subject and transforming it into a testosterone-fueled action film. Not saying that there's anything wrong with those kinds of films, it just wasn't what he wanted to make. When he spoke to the studio execs, he told them he didn't want to make some action film with Arnold Schwarzenegger or Stallone, he wanted to make something where the lead was more of an everyman, someone the audience could relate with. The studio said that's great because Arnold Schwarzenegger isn't available, and since Emilio Estevez did so well in Young Guns 2, we offered him the role. He then asked if they would consider a script rewrite. Murphy envisioned the role of Alex to be more of a medium-build guy, who was smart and fast, someone who could think a way out of his situations rather than punching his way out. The studio agreed. Murphy signed the contract and went back with a new writer, Stephen Pressfield, who was an uncredited writer on Total Recall. They worked to take the existing elements and make it something that was less Arnold and more Emilio. Coming off of Young Guns 2, the director remembered the good experience he had with Morgan Creek. They were so hands-off he was able to make creative changes that helped to improve the film without studio interference. He thought that since he proved himself with Young Guns 2, the studio would give him just as much control over Free Jack. He couldn't have been more wrong. Murphy wanted the new script to bring back some of the material that was cut from the book, as well as bring in some social satire. He submitted the new script, and the executives weren't happy. It seemed that even though they agreed to the changes he suggested, in the end, they just wanted an Arnold action film with or without the star. After the blockbuster success of Robin Hood, Jim Robinson, the chairman and CEO of Morgan Creek, thought he was a genius. He was riding the high of having the second largest grossing film of the year and thought that he knew what was best for every film that was coming down the pipe from the company. This started a long battle between the executives and the director. The director wanted to make the film he agreed to do, and the executives all wanted whatever the CEO wanted. There was another really big problem. Apparently when Morgan Creek accepted the original script, they signed the contract that certain aspects of it could not be changed under any circumstances. This was absurd. The director never heard of anything like this before. He started questioning as to why they agreed to him making changes to the script, only to point this out after he made changes to the script. Since rewriting the script was conditional to him signing on to make the movie, he thought he might be able to use that as a way to get out of his contract. When he tried this... They told him that nowhere in his contract was it stated that it was conditional on the rewrite. He met with his attorney who suggested he might win the case and void the contract if he sued, but made sure to mention that Morgan Creek had a reputation for being a very aggressive company. They indicated to him that if this were to go to court, 
They would put an injunction on him that would prevent him from taking any other work until this was settled. The court system in L.A. was incredibly slow. That meant this could take at least a year or longer before it was over. If he won, he was out of work for a year and now had a tarnished reputation for breaking his contract. If he lost, all of that, plus he now owed Morgan Creek a pile of money. The director said it was strange that they were willing to force a reluctant director into making a film that would cost them millions of dollars. It just didn't seem like the smartest thing to do if you wanted a good movie and would potentially make money. He figured the best course of action was just to make the movie. It'd certainly be faster than the legal system, although he knew that if things start badly on a production, they usually get worse. The studio insisted on hiring Stuart Oaken as the line producer who mostly worked in theater and had zero experience in sci-fi. He and the director really didn't get along. Oaken suggested Joe Alves for the production designer. The opposite of Oaken, Alves had plenty of experience. He worked on Jaws, Close Encounters, and Escape from New York. The director butted heads with him over his vision for the film. Murphy had his specific ideas, but Alves knew better than some bum from New Zealand who only made one movie in Hollywood. Never mind that Alves directed Jaws 3D, which had its own set of problems. With all the disputes from Murphy, the studio sided with Oaken and Alves on everything. Every major design and creative decision the director had was overruled. Alves designed the futuristic cars, and the director hated them. The director wanted something like the sleek spinners in Blade Runner or the interceptors from Mad Max. What he got was something else. Murphy said they were laughable and wanted better designs, but was overruled. The vehicles for the film cost half a million dollars. The cinematographer also wasn't a fan of Alves. He called his sets unimpressive and difficult to light. None of that mattered to the studio, though. Casting was done largely without the director's input. They already had Emilio Estevez, but now they needed the rest of the cast. For Alex's love interest, Julie Redland, they hired Linda Fiorentino. The director liked her for the role, because even though she was 33 at the time, with the right lighting, hair, and makeup, she easily passed for a 20-year-old. Then give her different makeup and a more sophisticated outfit, and she'd pass for older. The part needed this duality. Also, right away, she and Estevez had very good chemistry. For the part of the evil McCandless, the studio wanted Anthony Hopkins. He'd never done a sci-fi film before and liked the script, so he said yes. The filming was going to take place while he was in America for the Oscars, so he thought it would be nice to have something else to do while he was there. Silence of the Lambs hadn't been released yet, and the executives were hoping that if that was a hit, it would help at the box office with Free Jack. For additional parts, they hired Isai Morales, Amanda Plummer, Grandel Bush, David Johansson, Vincent Schiavelli, and David Roche. The director was happy to get Roche, as the satirical cop show Sledgehammer was a huge hit in New Zealand, but a flop in the U.S. For the leader of the Bone Jackers, Vicendak, they wanted someone unique, a person who stood out in a crowd. He had to be flamboyant with a commanding presence. The role was originally intended for Willem Dafoe, who met with the producers, but they passed on him when they thought about getting someone else. Mick Jagger. Jagger enacted before in Ned Kelly and the War Between the Tates. The studio sent him the script, and he was interested, but wanted to meet with the director first. Murphy flew to London to meet Mick at his apartment. Mick watched the director's film Utu and really liked it. The two chatted for about half an hour when he agreed to be in the movie. Jagger's a fan of sci-fi and liked the idea of being able to play a morally gray character. The Rolling Stones weren't touring at the moment, so he was available for the movie. Originally, the character of Vicendak was written to be dead serious, like Michael Ironside in Total Recall. Now with Mick Jagger, they made his character into more of, as they called him, a likable rascal. Filming was going to be split between two locations, Atlanta, Georgia, and New York. It'd be too complicated and expensive to film everything in New York, so the lion's share of the production would be in Atlanta, with only a few weeks in New York. They started filming in January of 1991. It was winter, but they had to make it look like summer. They rented some empty warehouses to build their sets in Atlanta. Everything from the classy upscale apartments to the dive club, the Industrial Revolution. Gay Bartolos and Dave Kinlon were on production hiatus from Basket Case 3 and were brought in to do the effects work for a full-body decapitation. It was a sequence where people were auctioning off their lives. 
The reason behind the scene was that if you have your head taken off, you can't be jacked. So everyone wants their head removed. Initially, the production was going well, but about two weeks into filming was when things took a turn for the worse. The studio didn't like what they were seeing in the dailies, and they insisted that something be done about it. They blamed everything they were seeing on Linda Fiorentino and wanted her off the production. The director was stunned because he thought she was doing a fine job. He spoke to the executives because surely they weren't seeing the bigger picture. Replacing a major character in a film that's already underway is not only disruptive to the process, but it was expensive. Fiorentino would have to be paid her full salary, even though she only filmed part of the movie. And whoever they cast as a replacement would have to be paid more since they were being brought into the production under duress. Murphy worked with the editor to put together a few scenes with her and Estevez to show how well they worked together. The executives weren't interested. It seemed their minds were already made up. They flew in ex-model-turned-actress Renee Russo and set up a meeting with the director. He thought that she was a fine actress, but didn't see her as right for the role. This didn't matter to Morgan Creek, as they had already made up their minds that she would be getting the part. The director thought he was meeting her so they could get his input to see if she was right for the role. As it turned out, per the director's Guild of America rules, the director had to be consulted before creative changes were made. This was his consultation. They didn't care what he thought. Murphy couldn't figure out why they were so hell-bent on getting rid of Fiorentino. He spoke to Robinson and asked him for a reason why. The CEO said, She doesn't give me a hard-on. For some reason, they fired David Roche, too. The executives then went back to L.A., leaving the production in shambles. Emilio Estevez now had to do all his scenes over again and connect with Russo. They didn't have the same chemistry, and the actor struggled with this element for the remainder of the shoot. Anthony Hopkins filmed for one week, mostly in front of a blue screen in Atlanta. They told him he'd have footage running behind him of the desert, the moon, and other locations. All practically shot footage added in with digital enhancements. Most of what they filmed for Anthony Hopkins would be appearing on a monitor screen. His scenes with the rest of the cast weren't until the end of the film. The McCandless building was made by DreamQuest. It was made to be twice as tall as the World Trade Center with 180 floors. The top floor is the spiritual switchboard, an electronic way to communicate with the dead, which was something taken from the novel. The design was inspired to look like a jack, which ended up also becoming the logo for the company. For the scenes where McCandless and Alex are attached to the spiritual switchboard, the director wanted to do some camera tricks and other practical effects for the scenes. The producers said no. It was 1991 and computer effects were becoming all the rage. They insisted they do all sorts of sexy, cutting-edge effects for the sequence. Despite the fact that the technology was so new, no one really understood it. They fumbled with the effects and footage for days, until finally putting something together that was, at the very least, good enough for those in charge. Filming took nine weeks in Atlanta, Georgia, and then they moved to New York for the last two weeks. The budget was originally $30 million, but was increased to a rumored $36 million to accommodate the changes. Mick Jagger understood the film was intended to have some humor, just not the usual on-the-nose type. There was a scene where Vicendak had to do a countdown, and he suggested they do it as Hickledy Pickledy 1, Hickledy Pickledy 2, but they changed it to... 1 Mississippi, 2 Mississippi, for the American audience. Mick Jagger's longtime partner, Jerry Hall, played the small part of the reporter. Murphy got along well with Jagger. One day while filming, Mick asked Murphy if he got a break after filming was over. He could tell he was under a huge amount of stress. He said yes, there was a few weeks where the editor would need time to get an assembly together. Jagger had a house in the Virgin Islands and told him he could take his family there to relax for a few weeks before coming back to edit the film. After filming was over, Murphy and his wife flew out and stayed in this tropical paradise. Jagger had a full staff that was living there year-round, whether he was there or not. They took care of the Murphys, and the entire thing was very surreal. The director used to be a painter, and with all the free time he had, he decided to break out some oil paints and paint a few pictures. He left the paintings there for Jagger as a thank you. Years later, Murphy's wife ran into Mick at Sundance. He told her he loved the paintings so much, he had them framed and they were still hanging in the house. After returning from a brief vacation, Murphy joined the editor to put together his cut of the film. They worked on the rough cut, and it seemed to be coming along well. Then they watched it. It was 
a mess. Things were terrible. The structure, the pacing, the tone were all over the place. They edited and re-edited the footage, but kept running into the same issues. Per DGA rules, after 10 weeks, they have to show the film in whatever its current state to the studio. So after 10 weeks, the studio didn't even watch it. They sent it straight to a test screening. It was a disaster. No one liked it. The studio then went into full panic mode and ordered reshoots. They said the film would need about three weeks worth of reshoots to redo certain scenes. Murphy asked, Okay, which scenes? We don't know. How do you know it'll take three weeks then? They brought back Shuset to write some new material. Roughly a week later, he had 15 new or retooled scenes for them to shoot. The director looked at them and gasped. Almost every scene was an action sequence. This was not going to fix the film. Murphy met with one of the producers and went over the new scenes. He decided to stand his ground and tell him the scenes were unshootable, and much to his surprise, the producer agreed. He did think some reshoots were needed, but that they should bring in a new writer. The CEO of Morgan Creek thought differently. He believed a good rock and roll soundtrack would fix everything. Doing the music for the film was multiple award-winning composer Mark Isham. Johnson called him up and told him to take the current cut of the film and add in 20 minutes of rock music. Isham called Murphy in a panic. Murphy had no idea what he was talking about because no one told him what was going on. You know, he's only the director. Isham filled the director in. He said he was given a few weeks to come up with an original rock score and didn't think he could do it. He also didn't think that it was right for the film. It was a futuristic sci-fi film, and the soundtrack should reflect that. Still, they had to do what the studio wanted. Isham rushed out 20 minutes of rock music that Murphy wasn't even allowed to listen to. Johnson hated it and terminated Isham's contract. At this point, Murphy went to the producers and asked to be fired. He figured, they were going to do whatever they wanted anyway, why should they keep him around? If he was fired, he'd be paid out for his work, but if he quit... They could, and most likely would, sue him for breach of contract. The producers refused, and he went back to work. Murphy returned with the cast to Atlanta to reshoot the material from the new writer, Dan Gilroy. Gilroy added in some humor to the new scenes, which ended up molding the film to be less serious and closer tonally to Total Recall. They hired composer Trevor Jones to do a completely new score for the film. They also bought the rights to rock songs from bands like the Scorpions and Eleven. Murphy took the new scenes and worked with the editor for another cut. He put together what he considered the best that he could do. His cut of the film ran for 95 minutes. Johnson hated it. He took the film and said he'd cut it together himself. There were two problems. The first was that the film was supposed to be sent out to the negative cutter in a few days. The other was that Johnson wasn't an editor. To fix this, he brought in a team of editors, each working on a different part of the film in a different editing suite. He'd go from room to room to oversee what they were doing and add his two cents. The film was recut as per the CEO's instructions, and its runtime was now 110 minutes. He admittedly hadn't watched the final edit. He just okayed it and sent it off to the negative cutters. When negotiating the contract, the director wanted what was called a possessory credit. That is a special label. When you see a certain film and it has a a so-and-so director film, that was something that that director had to specifically negotiate for. It's uncommon, so he had to struggle with them before they agreed to it. The director went to his agent and asked to have his possessory credit removed since this mess was no longer a Jeff Murphy film. He thought about having his directorial credit removed as well and going the Alan Smithy route, but that requires legal action and just wasn't worth it. On the other hand, the cinematographer, Amir Makri, had his credit removed. There was a lot of material that didn't make the final cut. Vincent Schiavelli was supposed to play an insurance salesman who sold policies to Free Jacks. I couldn't get a definitive answer as to if he was fired or if his scenes were cut. They removed many of the scenes that were filmed showing that life was cheap in the future. The nightclub, The Industrial Revolution, had public execution scenes which was possibly cut for time, but considering how rushed the final edit was, who knows why it was removed. The film was originally supposed to come out in the fall of 1991. With all the reshoots and re-edits, the film was delayed into 1992. The movie was released on January 17, 1992. It was by all measures a flop. 
It opened in fourth place and made only $17 million domestically. Critics and audiences didn't like it. Anthony Hopkins was asked why you would do such a film. His response was, I did it for fun and they paid me for it. Interviews with some of the cast were saying that the director let them all down by trying to focus too much on action instead of story. The reality was, he didn't want any of that. He was constantly pushing for a better story, but had the weight of the entire studio against him. It's possible the cast was largely unaware of just how much behind-the-scenes drama was going on. This was a shame because in an old Starlog issue, Emilio Estevez was talking about how much he got along with the director and was happy to be working with him again after Young Guns 2. This, of course, was before the movie was released. Although whenever a movie flops, you'll often see actors throwing it under the bus to detach themselves from it. And what was the idea? This Was was this a, like a, a futuristic? It's a terrible film. Science fiction. <laughs> the director took the full blame for the failure, even though it wasn't his fault. This made it much harder for Murphy to find more work in Hollywood. He was still getting offers, but they were much smaller productions. He did manage to land Under Siege 2 Dark Territory, his largest production, which did well, but not as well as the first film. Rene Russo met writer Dan Gilroy on Free Jack, and the two were married in March of 1992 and are still together today. Murphy returned to New Zealand and worked with Peter Jackson as the second unit director on the Lord of the Rings trilogy. In 2013, at the Rialto Channel New Zealand Film Awards, he was honored with a Lifetime Achievement Award. Sadly, Murphy passed away on December 3, 2018, at the age of 80. Despite how Hollywood treated him, that'll never take away from what he did for the art of filmmaking. Movies in New Zealand would absolutely not be the same without the contributions of Murphy. Jeff Murphy walked so Peter Jackson could run. I enjoy Free Jack for what it is, but I'm sad for what it isn't. It was supposed to be more of a thought-provoking film with satirical elements, but all that was ejected to make way for more action sequences. When not forced to appease the out-of-touch producers, Murphy was capable of making excellent films, so I'm sure his untampered version of Free Jack would have been something special. If you don't believe me, go back and look at some of the movies he made in New Zealand. These were movies that comparatively had very little budgets, but also, more importantly, no studio to hamper the director's vision. A movie like The Quiet Earth, what I consider to be one of the best films ever made, would not have been possible in a Hollywood environment. If the studio left Murphy alone for Free Jack like they did for Young Guns 2, people would still be talking about it today instead of dismissing it as 90s trash. It's infuriating to see a director not only get forced to make a film that was completely different from what he signed on for, but then for him to take the blame when it failed. In 2011, Morgan Creek, in a partnership with Universal, released the prequel to The Thing. I'm seeing a lot of parallels between the two productions. Free Jack's an entertaining sci-fi film with some fantastic ideas that are never fully realized. The juxtaposition between the haves and the have-nots is well done, but I agree the cars looked silly. None of the actors were phoning in their performances, although Estevez said he was more reacting than acting. Jagger was the right amount of smug as Vicendak, and his character is my favorite part of the movie. All in all, it's a very watchable film that has a lot going for it, and could have been something special, but instead, it was forced to be something it was never intended to be. It's not what the director wanted, and even when he tried to please the studio, it wasn't enough. Watching Free Jack now? It's a big, dumb, fun movie that just screams not missed opportunity, but purposefully botched opportunity. I hope your boner was worth it. Piss off. You can't get rid of me that easily.